Namaste. Welcome to Quick Wisdom with Bliss. My name is Bliss. Meow. And this is my cute little furball friend, Joy. <laughs> Spirituality is everywhere. In the air we breathe, in nature all around us, and even written into our very DNA. We are energy, and together as energy, we're all connected. We're all one. United as one, we are here on the stage of life to love and help each other live the best we can. Now, I know you've come today to learn about a very special topic. So let's put on our fun caps and get started on this sacred exploration. This is Quick Wisdom with Bliss. Unconditional Love. Joy and I hope you're ready to feel the love for this latest edition of Quick Wisdom with Bliss. Today we're going to dial away all the stress you may be feeling and help your mind and body become one. Are you ready, Joy? Joy, where did you go? Whoa, <laughs> aw, you're leaning up against me. Good kitty. Animals, just like people, know how to show love for their families. But some other folks, they practice something called unconditional love. Let's get ready to get the feels. So what is unconditional love? The answer is simple. It's a love without any conditions or limitations. Sometimes unconditional love is associated with other terms such as complete love or pure altruism. What's altruism? <laughs> yeah, it's a big word. Altruism is a term for someone who selflessly shows concern for others. Love is at the core of all religions and beliefs. Each religion has a particular way of describing unconditional love, and most of them agree that unconditional love is one that cannot be changed and has no bounds. Let's take a look at some of its main applications. In Christianity, unconditional love believed to be a part of something known as the four loves, friendship, affection, charity, and eros, which is the physical intimacy between people. Wow! Isn't the world magical? It's always telling us something if we take the time to listen. Now, listen to this! The study of animal behavior is known as ethology. In ethology, unconditional love refers to altruism and altruism refers to the act of bettering others before bettering yourself. For instance, dogs are believed to be prime examples of animals who display unconditional love. Yes, Joy, cats can too! <laughs> Ethology is the objective and scientific study of animal behavior. Its focus is usually on behavior under natural conditions and viewing behavior as an evolutionary adaptive trait. Behaviorism is another term that also describes the objective and scientific study of animal behavior, normally referring to measured responses to stimuli or trained behavioral interventions within a laboratory context. It should be noted that when it comes to ethology, there is no particular emphasis on evolutionary adaptivity. All throughout history, different naturalists have examined every aspect of animal behavior. Ethology has its scientific roots in the work of Charles Darwin, who lived from the year 1809 until the year 1882. The modern discipline of ethology is considered by many to have begun during the 30s with the work of Dutch biologist Nicolaas Tinbergen and of Austrian biologists Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch. The three recipients of the 1973 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. They were some super smart dudes. <laughs> 
Ethology combines field and laboratory science with a strong relation to some other disciplines such as ecology, neuroanatomy, and evolutionary biology. Ethologists exhibit interest in a behavioral process rather than in a particular animal group. They frequently focus on one type of behavior and lots of unrelated species, such as aggression. Ethology is a quickly growing field. Since the beginning of the 21st century, scholars have re-examined and reached new conclusions in many aspects of animal communication, culture, learning, emotions, and much more that the scientific community never adequately understood. As a result, new fields like neuroethology have developed. Understanding ethology or animal behavior can be crucial in animal training. Considering the natural practices of different species or breeds enables trainers to select the individuals best suited to perform the required task. It also allows trainers to encourage the performance of naturally occurring behaviors and the discontinuance of undesirable behaviors. The application of unconditional love in psychology is similar to how it's applied in ethology. In psychology, unconditional love is known to be a state of mind that puts the goals of another before the goals of oneself. The term is also broadly used in couples and family counseling manuals. In ethology and more generally in the study of social evolution, sometimes animals behave in ways that reduce their fitness but increase the fitness of other individuals in the population. This is a form of altruism. Research in evolutionary theory has been applied to social behavior, including altruism. Cases of animals helping individuals to whom they are strictly related can be explained by kin selection and are not considered pure altruism. Beyond the physical exertions that in some species mothers and some species fathers undertake to protect their young, extreme examples of sacrifice can happen. One gross example is matrophagy. That's the consumption of the mother by her offspring. This happens with a spider known as the stegodyphus. Another nasty example of this is when a male spider allows a female fertilized by him to eat him. Such is the case of an English evolutionary biologist, William Donald Hamilton. Hamilton's rule, also known as kin selection, describes the benefit of such altruism in terms of the coefficient of relationship to the beneficiary and the benefit granted to the beneficiary minus the cost to the sacrificer. Should this sum be greater than zero, a fitness gain will result from the sacrifice. When obvious altruism is not between kin, it could be based on reciprocation. For instance, a monkey will present its back to another monkey who will pick out parasites. After a little while, the roles will be reversed. Such reciprocity pays off in evolutionary terms as long as the costs of helping are less than the benefits of being supported and as long as animals will not gain in the long run by cheating or by receiving favors without returning them. This is spoken about in length as part of the evolutionary game theory and precisely the prisoner's dilemma as social theory. What do you think about that, Joy? Wow! <laughs> You're so cute, Joy. I love you. Sorry, lost in cuteness. <laughs> Let's continue. Some people make a distinction between conditional and unconditional love. In conditional love, love is earned on the basis of unconscious or conscious conditions met by the lover. 
In unconditional love, love is given freely to the loved one, no matter what the circumstances. Loving is primary. Unconditional love is believed to be infinite and without measure, and conditional love requires some kind of finite exchange. Unconditional love shouldn't be confused with something known as unconditional dedication. Unconditional duty or dedication refers to an act of the will regardless of feelings. Unconditional love separates the person from their behaviors. Humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers talked about an unconditional dedication and positive regard towards one single support. According to Rogers, the individual needed an environment that gave them, with authenticity, self-disclosure, genuineness, empathy, openness, approval, and acceptance. American psychologist Abraham Maslow also supported the unconditional love perspective by stating that in order to grow, an individual has to have a positive outlook of themselves. In his book, Man Searching for Meaning, Holocaust survivor and logotherapist Viktor Frankl outlined parallels between the human capacity to living a meaningful life and the ability to love unconditionally. Frankl once wrote, Love is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality. No one can become fully aware of the essence of another human being unless he loves him. Furthermore, by his love, the loving person enables the beloved person to actualize potentialities. For Frankl, unconditional love is a means by which we enable and reach human potential. There's been some evidence to suggest that there's a part of the brain that fosters unconditional love. Such evidence may indicate that unconditional love is different than other types of love. Canadian cognitive neuroscientist Mario Beauregard and his colleagues conducted a study using a functional magnetic resonance imaging test also known as an fMRI procedure. Beauregard and his group studied the brain imaging of participants who were presented with different sets of images, showing both maternal or unconditional love or romantic love. The study revealed that seven areas of the brain became active when these test subjects were reminded of feelings of unconditional love, three of which were similar to areas that became active when shown images of romantic love. The other four active parts varied, highlighting certain brain regions that are associated with pleasurable feelings, rewarding aspects, and human maternal behaviors that were stimulated during the unconditional love portions of the examination. The study concluded that according to certain types of active neural stimuli, the feeling of love for someone without the need of being rewarded is indeed different from the sense of romantic love. There's a great question, Joy! Is love or unconditional love a biological response? The practice of evolutionary psychology has offered several explanations for love. Both human children and monkey infants are dependent on parental help for a very long time. Therefore, love has is seen as a mechanism to promote mutual parental support of children for an extended period. From the evolutionary psychology perspective, the behaviors and experiences associated with love can be examined in terms of how they have been shaped by human evolution. For instance, it has been proposed that during evolution, human language was a type of mating signal that allowed potential mates to judge reproductive fitness. Joy, are you ready to learn more? <laughs> That's what I thought. Here we go. Blessings of knowledge. 
let these facts heal us with understanding. Evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey F. Miller described his practice as a starting place for future research. Cognitive neuroscience could try to localize courtship adaptations in the brain. Most importantly, we need much better observations concerning real-life human courtship, including the measurable aspects of courtship that influence mate choice, the reproductive consequences of individual variation in those aspects, and the social, cognitive, and emotional mechanisms of falling in love. Since the time of English naturalist, geologist, and biologist, best known for his contributions to the science of evolution, Charles Darwin, there have been similar speculations about the development of human interest in music, also as a potential signaling system for attracting and judging the fitness of potential mates. It's been proposed that the human capacity to experience love has evolved as a signal to would-be mates that the partner will be a good parent and be likely to help pass genes to future generations. Biologist Jeremy Griffith defines love as unconditional selflessness. This suggests that utterly cooperative instincts, initially developed in modern humans' ancestors, Australopithecus, studies of a great ape previously referred to as pygmy chimpanzee and now known as bonobos are often cited in support of a cooperative past in humans. The conventional view in biology is that there are three primary drives in love, libido, attachment, and partner preference. The primary neurochemicals that govern these drives are estrogen, testosterone, dopamine, vasopressin, and oxytocin. Central dopamine pathways mediate partner preference behavior, while vasopressin in the ventral pallidum and oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens and paraventricular hypothalamic nucleus meditate partner preference and attachment behaviors. Trace amines like phenethylamine and tyramine play a critical role in regulating neuronal activity in the dopaminergic pathways of the central nervous system. Testosterone and estrogen contribute to these drives by modulating activity within dopamine pathways. Adequate brain levels of testosterone seem important for both human male and female sexual behavior. Norepinephrine and serotonin have a less significant, contributing role through the neuromodulatory effects upon dopamine and oxytocin release in certain pathways. The chemicals triggered that are responsible for passionate love and long-term attachment love seem to be more particular to the activities in which both persons participate rather than to the nature of the specific people involved. Individuals who have recently fallen in love show higher levels of cortisol. In A General Theory of Love, three professors of psychiatry from the University of California, San Francisco, provide an overview of the scientific theories and findings relating to the role of the limbic system in love, attachment, and social bonding. They advance the hypothesis that our nervous systems are not self-contained, but instead demonstrably attuned to those around us and those with whom we are most close. This empathy, which they call limbic resonance, is a capacity which we share, along with the anatomical characteristics of the limbic areas of the brain with all other mammals. Their work builds on previous studies of the importance of physical contact and affection in social and cognitive development, such as the experiments conducted by Harry Harlow on the rhesus monkeys, which first established the biological consequences of isolation. Brain scanning techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging have been used to investigate brain regions that seem to be involved in producing the human experience of love. 
In 2000, a study led by Samir Zaki and Andreas Bartels of University College London concluded that at least two areas of the brain become more active when in love. These were foci in the media insula which the brain associates with instinct and part of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is associated with feelings of euphoria. Conscious thoughts about a romantic partner activate brain regions related to reward and motivation. Studies have investigated whether unconscious priming by a partner's name could also affect motivation. They found that priming by either a beloved or a favorite hobby improved reaction times in identifying whether a string of letters was a word or not compared against priming by a neutral friend. The author suggested this effect happens because a beloved's name may call for a goal-directed state and produce dopaminergic-driven facilitation effects. That is quick wisdom if you ask me. What do you think, Joy? <laughs> well said, Joy. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, are you ready to get deeper into this? Okay then. Unconditional love also has a role in many different aspects of religion. In Christianity, unconditional love can be used to demonstrate God's love for a person regardless of that person's love for God. The term isn't used explicitly in the Bible. Instead, it advocates for God's unconditional and conditional love. By using different interpretations or passages to support their point of view, our both terms are encountered. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was once quoted as saying, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. The primary use of unconditional in Christianity is the statement that God so loved the world. In other words, God loves the world enough to suffer for us without necessity. There is then the post-condition of actually accepting God's favor. <gasps> What's that, Joy? Does love factor into Buddhism? Of course it does! You knew that, you silly kitty! You're just trying to get my attention so that I give you a treat! <laughs> One of the essential concepts in Buddhism is known as the Bodhisattva. What's that, you ask? That's a great question! Bodhisattva is a spontaneous wish to gain enlightenment that is motivated by compassion for all living beings accompanied by a falling away of the attachment to the illusion of an inherently existing self. There are two types of Bodhisattva. Absolute and Relative and Bodhisattva in Relative Bodhisattva, a person learns about the need to gain an understanding of unconditional love, which is expressed in Buddhism as loving-kindness and compassion. The point is to create Bodhisattva for all living beings. Absolute Bodhisattva is a more perplexing, tantric teaching. Understanding the principle of loving-kindness and compassion is shown when an individual treats all sentient beings as if they are or had been in a former life their mother. A mother will do anything for the benefit of her child. The most loving of all relationships is that between a mother and her child. Of course, if everyone treated each other as if they were their child, then there would be much less hostility in this world. Can you imagine a peaceful world like that, Joy? Meow, indeed. <laughs> this is an essential part of Buddhism. At any given moment, an individual has the opportunity to choose how they act. They can also be completely mindful of how their action will affect those around them. In the practice of Hinduism, the Sanskrit word bhakti is used by people as a means to refer to the concept of unconditional love, even though its root meaning seems to be participate. Bhakti or bhakti is the unconditional religious devotion of a devotee and worship of a divine. 
Bhakti literally means attachment, participation, fondness for, homage, faith, love, devotion, worship, purity. It was initially used in Hinduism as a means to refer to the devotion and love for a personal god or a representational god by a devotee. According to ancient texts like the Shvatashitara Upanishad, the term simply means to participate, show devotion to, and exhibit love for any endeavor. However, in the Bhagavad Gita, it implies one of the possible paths of spirituality and towards moksha, as in bhakti marga. Bhakti in Indian religions is emotional devotionalism, particularly to a personal god or to spiritual ideas. The term also cites a movement pioneered by the Tamil poet saints of South India who were also known as Alvars and a group of 63 saints living in Tamil Nadu during the 6th to 8th centuries CE who were devoted to the Hindu god Shiva known as Nayanars. The movement developed around the gods Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, and Devi in the second half of the first millennium CE. It snowballed in India after the 12th century in the various Hindu traditions, possibly in response to the arrival of Islam in India. Bhakti ideas have served as the inspiration for many saint poets and accessible texts in India. For example, the Bhagavata Purana is a Krishna-related text that's associated with the Bhakti movement in Hinduism. Bhakti can also be found in other religions that are practiced in India, and it has influenced Bhakti reactions between Hinduism and Christianity in the modern era. Nirguni Bhakti, meaning devotion to the divine without attributes, is found in both Sikhism and Hinduism. Outside of India, emotional devotion is found in some Southeast Asian and East Asian Buddhist traditions, where it is sometimes referred to as bhati. The Sanskrit word bhakti comes from the verb root bhai, which means to divide, to share, to partake, to participate, to belong to. The word also means attachment, devotion to, fondness for, homage, faith or love, worship, piety, to something as a spirit, bhakti religious principle or means of salvation. The meaning of the term bhakti is comparable to but different from kama. Kama suggests an emotional bhakti connection, sometimes with sensual devotion and real love. In contrast, bhakti is spiritual, a passion and dedication to religious concepts or principles that touch upon both intellection and emotion. These fun facts fill my heart with happiness. I love learning, don't you? I hope these spiritual concepts are becoming clear. Let's keep learning! According to a religious historian named Karen Petulis, the word bhakti shouldn't be thought of as an uncritical emotion, but as bhaktited engagement. Professor Petulis also believes that the concept of bhakti in Hinduism involves a simultaneous tension between passion and intellection. She once wrote, Emotion to reaffirm the social context and temporal freedom, intellection to ground the Bhaktirants in a thoughtful, conscious approach. A person who practices bhakti is called a bhakta. In Vedic Sanskrit literature, the term bhakti has a general meaning of mutual attachment, devotion, fondness for, devotion to, like the ones found in human relationships, frequently between king and subject, beloved and lover, friend and friend, and of course parent and child. It can also refer to devotion towards a spiritual teacher as Guru Bhakti, or even a personal god, or for spirituality without form. 
this is known as Nirguna. According to a Sri Lankan Buddhist scholar named Sanath Nanayakara, no term in English adequately translates or represents the concept of bhakti in Indian religions. Terms like devotion, faith, devotional faith represent certain aspects of bhakti, but it means a heck of a lot and more. This concept includes a deep sense of affection and attachment, but not wish, because a wish is selfish, affection is unselfish. Nanayakara goes on to say that some scholars associated with sadha, which means faith, trust, or confidence. However, bhakti can imply an end in itself or a pathway towards spiritual wisdom. The term bhakti alludes to one of several other spiritual paths towards spiritual freedom, salvation, and liberation. In Hinduism, this is known as moksha, and it is known as bhakti yoga or bhakti marga. The other paths are the path of knowledge, known as janana marga, the path of works known as karma marga, and the path of contemplation and meditation known as raja marga. The term bhakti has often been translated as devotion. Bhaktianchalanist literature, during the colonial era, Writers described bhakti as a primitive religious devotion of lay people with monotheistic parallels or simply a form of mysticism. However, scholars have said devotion is an incomplete and misleading translation of bhakti. Modern scholars have questioned this terminology and most now trace the term bhakti as one of the several spiritual perspectives that emerged from reflections on the Vedic context and Hindu way of life. In Indian religions, bhakti is not a ritualistic devotion to religion or God. Instead, it's a participation in a path that includes ethics, behavior, spirituality, and the essential or characteristic customs and conventions of a community. Among other things, it involves the refining of an individual state of mind, knowing a God, internalizing God, and participating in God. Increasingly, the term participation is appearing in scholarly literature instead of devotion. This is a gloss for the term bhakti. David Lorenzen, a scholar of religious studies, author and professor of South Asian history at the Center for Asian and African Studies in El Colegio de Mexico, states that bhakti is an important term in both Sikhism and Hinduism. Sikhism and Hinduism share a lot of core spiritual ideas and concepts, but bhakti of nirguni, meaning devotion to divine without attributes, is particularly crucial in Sikhism. In Hinduism, broad ideas continue where both saguni and nirguni bhakti, again saying devotion to divine with or without attributes, or alternate paths towards spirituality are among the options left to the choice of a Hindu. This brings us to the Upanishads. Do you know what they are, Joy? No? Well, let me explain it to you. The Upanishads are the ancient Sanskrit texts of spiritual teachings and ideas of Hinduism. The last of three epilogue verses of the Shvatashvatara Upanishad from the first millennium BCE uses the word bhakti as follows. He who has highest bhakti of deva or god, just like his deva, so for his guru or teacher, to him who is high-minded, these teachings will be illuminating. Shvatashvatara Upanishad 623 one of the earliest uses of the word bhakti in ancient Indian literature and has been translated as the love of God, historians have long debated whether or not this phrase is authentic or a later insertion into the Upanishad. There is also discussion as to whether the term bhakti and deva meant the same in this ancient text as they do in the modern era. A German-born 
philologist and orientalist named Max Muller believes that the word bhakti appears only one time in this Upanishad. The term was later used in much later texts. Scholars agree that bhakti is a post-Vedic movement that began developing during the epics and Puranas era of Indian history. The Bhagavad Gita is the very first text to use the word bhakti to denote a religious path. It uses it as a term for one of three possible spiritual approaches. The Bhagavata Purana grows the idea in a far more elegant way, and the Shvatashvatara Upanishad presents evidence of Guru Bhakti, which is the devotion to one's spiritual teacher. The Bhakti movement is the fast growth of Bhakti. It first began in the later part of the first millennium CE. It began in Tamil Nadu in southern India with the Saiva Nayanars and the Vasnava Alvars. Their practices and ideas inspired Bhakti poetry and devotion throughout India over the 12th to 18th century CE. The Alvars, also known as those immersed in God, were the Vaishnava poet saints who traveled from temple to temple singing the praises of Vishnu. They established temple sites and converted many people to Vaishnavism. Like the Alvars, the Saiva Nainar poets were incredibly influential. A compilation of hymns by 63 Nainar poets called the Turumurai is still of great importance in South India. Hymns by three of the most prominent 7th century poets, such as Apar and Kampantar and the 9th century poet Sundarar, were compiled into the Tearam, the first volumes of the Turumurai. The poets' wandering lifestyle helped to create pilgrimage in temple sites while spreading devotion to Shiva. Early Tamil Siva Bhakti poets are quoted in the Black Yajur Veda. The Nayanars and Alvars were vital in spreading the Bhakti tradition. The Bhagavata Purana's references to the South Indian Alvar saints, alongside its emphasis on Bhakti, led many scholars to say it has origins in South India. However, some historians question whether this evidence excludes the possibility that Bhakti movement had parallel developments in other parts of India. Scholars agreed that the Bhakti movement focused on the deities Vishnu, Shakti, Shiva, and other gods, whose development and spread in India was in response to the arrival of Islam in India around the 8th century CE. The Bhakti movement swept through East and North India from the 15th century onwards. It reached its zenith somewhere between the 15th and 17th century CE, and Bhakti ideas and poetry influenced a great many aspects of Hindu culture, both secular and religious. This all led to it becoming an integral part of Indian society. It extended its influence to Christianity, Jainism, and Sufism. During the Bhakti movement period in the 15th century, Guru Nanak, also known as Baba Nanak, was the founder of Sikhism and the first of ten Sikh Gurus. The movement is considered to be an influential social reformation in Hinduism, as it gave individuals a more focused alternative path towards spirituality regardless of their gender or birth caste. Postmodern historians question this traditional view and whether the Bhakti movement was ever a rebellion or social reform of any kind. Scholars suggest that the Bhakti movement was a revival, reworking, and recontextualization of ancient Vedic traditions. In Islamic belief, unconditional love can only be given to Allah. The highest spiritual attainment in Islam is directly related to the love of God. Yet there are men who take others besides God as equal. They love them as they should love God. But those of faith are overflowing in their love for God. O oh, lovers, the religion of the love of God isn't just found in Islam. In the realm of love, there is neither disbelief nor belief.
According to Islamic Sufism, unconditional love is the basis for the divine love known as Ishq-i-Hakiki. Prominent mystics explain the concept in its entirety and describe its hardcore reality. A Muslim saint and Sufi mystic named Rabia of Basra was the one who first put forth the doctrine of divine love known as Ishki Hakiki. It is widely thought to be the most important of the early rejections, one mode of loyalty that would eventually become labeled as Sufism. Rabia prayed, O oh Lord, if I worship you because of fear of hell, then burn me in hell. If I worship you because I desire paradise, then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for yourself alone, then deny me not your eternal beauty. The term Ishq means to love God unconditionally and selflessly. For a 13th century Persian poet, Faqi, Islamic scholar, theologian, and Sufi mystic originally from Greater Khorasan, named Rumi Sufism itself is Ishq and not the path of severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons, known as Zut. According to a Sufi mystic, poet, and scholar named Sultan Bahu, the definition of Ishq is to serve God unconditionally by devoting a person's entire life to Him while asking for no reward in return. Wow! I can feel my spirit evolving as we learn all this new and important information. And there's more! Yes, joy, unconditional love appears in other religions as well. Neo-paganism in general, and Wicca in particular, traditionally use an inspirational text called Charge of the Goddess. It affirms that to the goddess's law is love unto all beings. The Chinese belief Mohism, from the year 500 BCE, bases its entire premise on the supremacy of such an element. It compares an individual's duty to the indiscriminate generosity of the sky or heaven. This comes in stark contrast to Confucianism, which is based primarily on the model of society that pertains to family love and duty. Later, schools took part in a substantial debate regarding how unconditional a person could be in an actual community. Unitarian Universalism doesn't have a set doctrine or a religious creed. It accepts the belief that all human beings are worthy and in need of unconditional love through charity and spiritual understanding in the community. The Unitarian Universalist Association contends that in the seven principles, where the inherent worth and dignity of all humans is a regularly quoted agape arguing for unconditional love. That brings us to something known as agape. Ready to learn about that? You bet your furry tail you are! Agape is a griso christian term referring to love. The love of God for man and of man for God, and the highest form of love, charity. Agape shouldn't be confused with brotherly love or self-love, as it embraces a universal unconditional love that persists and transcends regardless of circumstance. It goes beyond emotions to the extent of seeking the best for others. The noun form first occurs in Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, known as the Septuagint. However, the verb form goes as far back as Homer, and it literally translates to affection as in show affection for the dead, and greet with affection. Other ancient writers have used forms of the word to indicate a love of a spouse or a family, or the affection for a particular activity. Within Christianity, agape is believed to be the love Christ had for humankind, or the love that originates from God. In the New Testament, it refers to the covenant love of God for humans, as well as the reciprocal human love for God. The term extends to the love of one's fellow man. Some modern writers have tried to continue the use of agape into non-religious contexts. 
The concept of agape has been vigorously studied within its Christian context. It has also been thought of in the settings of other religions, science, and religious ethics. There are a few examples of the word agape that have been documented in polytheistic Greek literature. Walter Bauer's Lexicon, one of the most highly respected dictionaries of Biblical Greek, mentions a somber encryption that was most likely used to honor a polytheistic army officer who was held in high esteem by his country. A Time Magazine journalist once described the verse John 3.16 as one of the most famous and well-known Bible verses. It has been called the Gospel in a Nutshell because it's considered a summary of the central doctrines of Christianity. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16, King's James Version. The word agape gained a broader usage from later Christian writers as the word that indicates explicitly Christian love or charity, or even God Himself. The expression, God is love, appears twice in the New Testament. Agape has also been used by the early Christians to indicate a generous love of God for humanity, which they were committed to returning and practicing towards God and each other. Agape has been theorized on many Christian writers in an explicitly Christian context. A British writer and theologian named Clive Staples Lewis used agape in his book, The Four Loves, to describe what he believes is the highest level of love known to humanity, a selfless love that is passionately committed to the well-being of others. The Christian use of the term comes directly from the canonical Gospels account of the teachings of Jesus. When asked what the Great Commandment was, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 37-40 in Judaism, the first, love the Lord thy God, is part of Shema, also known as the Leviticus 19.18, while the second, love neighbor as thyself, is a commandment from Deuteronomy 6.5. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love agapes, your neighbor, and hate your enemy, but I say to you, Love, agape, your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Matthew 5, 43-46 RSV a prolific early Christian author from the Carthage in the Roman province of Africa named Tertullian said in his second century defense of Christians known as Apology 39 that Christian love attracted pagan notice. What marks us in the eyes of our enemies is our loving kindness. Only look, they say, look how they love one another. Angelican theologian O.C. Quick writes that this agape within human experience is a very partial and rudimentary realization and that, in its pure form, it is essentially divine. If we could imagine the love of one who loves men purely for their own sake, and not because of any need or desire of his own, purely desires their good, and yet loves them wholly, not for what at this moment they are, but for what he knows he can make of them because he made them, then we should have in our minds some true image of the love of the Father and Creator of mankind. In the New Testament, the word agape is frequently used to describe God's love. However, other forms of the word are used 
in a negative context, like the various forms of the verb agapeo. Examples include 2 Timothy 4 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved in this present world. John 12 43. For they loved Agapsian, the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 3 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men loved Agapsian darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. A Swiss Reformed theologian named Karl Barth distinguishes agape from eros, the Greek god of love, on the basis of its unconditional character and origin. In agape, humanity doesn't merely express its nature, but transcends it. Agape identifies with the well-being of the neighbor, in utter independence of the question of his attractiveness, and with no expectation of reciprocation. The word agape is used in its plural form, agapai, in the New Testament to describe a feast eaten by early Christians as in Jude 1, 12 and 2 Peter 2, 13. Love unconditional and otherwise will continue to inspire the masses and enlighten the mind. Without it, the world would be a much darker place. Yes, joy even for kitties. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Quick Wisdom with Bliss. Joy and I will see you again next time. Namaste. <laughs>